Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first session here. Uh, those of you in chat, I'm just saying this for the people who are watching the video later. Um, this is a, a familiar modality for me. I've taught online before. Um, if it's unfamiliar to you, though, um, please stay in contact with me about any technical difficulties that are happening for you um, so we can get those cleared away. Um, I do want to apologize for how late the links got sent out. I got them out like a few minutes before 9.30 here, and my original plan was to send them out at like 9, 9.15, something like that. Um, I should be able to be doing that into the future. Uh, for some reason, my computer just did not want to cooperate this morning. I was booting up and trying to get all the programs going, and it was web pages kept crashing, all that kind of stuff. So um, this is not going to be the norm, but you can count on uh, on me getting a link out and it'll happen. You're my first class of the day, so uh, this shouldn't be an issue for my other classes, but it will be for this one, uh, or it was today, but it shouldn't be in the future. So um, there will pro it'll be a different link every time. Um, every time I create a new Skype um, phone call chat room thing meeting I think is what they call it um, there will be a new link out so you can expect a email and a post on canvas uh, daily for when we're holding classes and uh, and you'll be able to get connected here and as I said in the um, email I sent out yesterday I think the best kind of uh, policy for how we go about doing this is uh, that when you come into the chat room, um, if you've got a microphone, just mute it. And uh, if you want to talk, you're very free to talk on the video. Uh, it'll hopefully show up. Um, I might repeat what you say because the microphone doesn't always pick out of my speakers. Or it actually won't at all because I'm using headphones. So if you say something, um, I will repeat it for the sake of those who are watching this on YouTube later who won't have that recorded in the video. Um, like if you ask a question or have a comment. Um, and then <clears throat> uh, then I can respond. But if you wanted to do something like that, uh, the convention is sort of like raising your hand in class. You can make a little post in the um, uh, the comment uh, I am conversation um, that we've got in the room, and then I can know uh, that something's going on. Sometimes I can also see like Anthony is typing a message right now, so I can I can tell that yeah there you go yeah just like that Anthony. Um, I can kind of see whether people are thinking about things and and what's going on there. Um, I think for the ease, another question uh, people might have is how attendance will be taken for this. And uh, I'm thinking um, just for ease of timing and everything like that, um, I'm not going to manually enter uh, people's attendance in um, during the session. So if you're here live, uh, you'll still need to, um, or if you're if you're watching it later on YouTube, or if you're here live, either way, for everybody, um, I will be making little quizzes on Canvas. These aren't quizzes that require you to explain what Nozick means by an end state principle or something like that. It'll be, I'll just give out a code word uh, at some point during the video, and uh, you just have to input that code word into the quiz. Um, there'll be just one question that asks you, like, what was the code word? And you can input that in, and then that's how I'll track attendance. Um, so that's how that's going to function. Um, and let me see if there's any other questions people have in the chat about just the format of how this is going to work. Um, any questions about how things go from here? I wanted to definitely make some time for... Uh, I tried to anticipate as many things as I could in the email yesterday, but, you know, it's always possible I missed something. Uh, or that you just have a question about something. So um, <clears throat> anyone in the chat here, we got 15 people. Awesome. Um, love to have more. Um, but anyone have, have questions about what's going on here or how we're going to proceed for the next couple weeks? Okay. Looks like I got a couple of people in the chat typing, so 
Um, I'm going to wait for those to come in. If you want to use a microphone too, you're very free to do so if you want. Looks like maybe that's a no. No no questions. No? Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> something else I wanted to say here before we get started with Nozick. Um, I just want to thank everybody again for um, being willing to take this course of action. I know um, I'm not going to share... Uh, here, this, that, that feels better. Um, although now I'm like, ooh, <laughs> um, I can't stand over there. There's not enough space to stand. Um, so uh, I, I'm not going to share people's personal information or personal situations, but I can report to the entire class that um, there there is a lot of thanks um, that I've received from people for um, the willingness to make this transition to make this kind of accommodation for the circumstances. And while uh, I, I don't I don't deserve uh, that credit or that thanks, I mean, other than to just be responsive, um, but it's really you who, it's all of you who deserve that thanks of your willingness to deal with the kind of uh, inconveniences of this. But I also know that in some cases it isn't merely inconvenience, um, but there are other complications that are more serious to make this possible um, but there are a, a, there are a lot of students who are in situations where this is this is making school possible instead of being impossible and that that's really really valuable and so um, I want I want I want to thank all of you for uh, cooperating with this and making it happen and with regard to those complications please please I tried to really <laughs> emphasize this in my email yesterday please stay in contact with me about it. I, I've been encouraging this the whole quarter from the very first day anyway, but especially under these circumstances, let me be a support to you. Um, and one of the best ways that you can do that is by letting me know what's going on for you. So uh, otherwise I'm trying to anticipate things and make this work as um, effectively as possible for everyone's situation. But if I know more about your specific individual circumstances, I can be more responsive to it, and I want to be responsive to it. This is this is all about making education accessible, and if the complications that are happening with the format are hurting that, then I want to do everything in our power to, to blunt the force of that or ameliorate those concerns. So um, definitely want to repeat that again explicitly here. Um, I may try to move my computer so that I can... Uh, be more comfortable in how I'm standing. <laughs> you can see my beautiful apartment complex. Um, okay, with with all the all the busyness that was going on yesterday, I have not had the chance to read through your reading comments for Nozick. I usually try to have that prepared and ready to go, um, but that has not been possible so far. Um, but I wanted to say, um, I think my plan right now today is to just proceed with our, um, with a kind of lecture on Nozick, and then um, I'm going to get to the your comments uh, in tomorrow's video, tomorrow's class. Um, there we go, that's a lot better. Okay, my toes feel a lot better now. Okay, so that, that's how I think we're going to proceed here. Of course, as always, everyone in the chat, you are absolutely free to jump in, interrupt, ask questions. Maybe you remember some of the things from your reading comments that you wanted to talk about or ask about. Um, but uh, please bring them up as we go here. Uh, th this is a little, little more technical um, than some of the other stuff that we've been reading and thinking about. Um, but let's let's get going with it. Unless there's anything else anyone wants to say or or any other questions you want to ask. I'll just make a little pause here to see if anyone jumps on the chat. 
if you're typing a big message, if you could say like one second I got a message, just a really quick thing to send so I know to wait or not to wait, that, that's also helpful usually when I do these sorts of things. Not seeing anything. Okay. But I'm going to keep going. All right. Um, so Nozick is... Uh, yesterday I mentioned this idea again about uh, society as a system of social cooperation. And that's a really, really core idea for, for following what's going on with, with Nozick, with Rawls, with Cohen, the Marxists we're going to look at next week. Um, very, very important. And it's just important, I think, for understanding... I think it's a very helpful theoretical lens for just understanding what is it that we disagree about when we have disagreements about social justice or how our society ought to be organized or what should be happening in politics. The reality is whether we like it or not, we're a part of a system of cooperation. You maybe didn't ask to be a part of it, like you were born here, let's say, you're a U.S. citizen and you're just treated as a member of that community and you don't get to decide that. Maybe you get to decide later. You could go uh, immigrate someplace else or renounce your citizenship or <laughs> avoid paying your taxes or something like that. Like You can do behaviors that cut against that system, but that system also is designed for dealing with those situations and dealing with you. And uh, that also becomes the de facto system of cooperation. I think the really important point here is that cooperation, when we say society is a system of cooperation, we're not saying something that's like a big hippie statement. Um, it's uh, important to recognize cooperation doesn't mean consensus. It doesn't mean agreement. It doesn't mean that people aren't competing or fighting with each other uh, or antagonistic toward each other. Um, even institutional legalized slavery is a system of cooperation. It's just an incredibly unjust one. And that's the real question, is like, if we we're going to set up the rules for how society functions, what would be a just uh, way of setting that up? Um, and especially when it comes to the topic we're about to do, we're curious about what is a just system for handling property and economic activity. And we're not going to be covering every single dimension to this, because there's a lot to talk about there. Um, but we're, we are going to be, Nozick wants to focus specifically on property. Um, Rawls is going to look at it in a, in a little bit wider in terms of the distribution of social benefits and social burdens. Uh, that's going to be the main thing that Rawls is concerned with. Um, but we're, we can kind of think about that in terms of property as well. Um, and then the Cohen piece, uh, for this contemporary Marxist, is also going to be talking explicitly about property um, and, and justice with regard to property and capitalism, right? Communally held property versus private property will be a major theme of that work. Um, so that's, that's what we're going to be thinking about. But even for something like property, like yesterday I was talking about how like Locke thinks I own my body. And I have a right to it. And for anyone else to interfere with it, that's something wrong, right? They shouldn't be doing that. Um, even that requires a system of cooperation to respect that space. There have to be rules, maybe laws, maybe social conventions um, that uh, protect that if it's going to exist. And if it's not protected, then that right in a de facto way doesn't exist. Now, uh, we talked before, like weeks ago, about this idea how rights can't be taken away. But what we're talking about there are moral rights. We're talking about what someone really does have right to. And that could be different than what they are given by social institutions or political institutions. So there, there could be an, a de facto absence of a space that respects those moral rights. So those legal rights or social rights don't exist, even if you still retain the moral right. So if I have a moral right to life and my society is engaged in genocide against a group that I belong to, then I still have my rights. <laughs> they're just, they're not existing in society. Society doesn't have the safeguards placed in order to protect it. Um, Let's, let's go to a less extreme example, though. Let's say there isn't genocide going on, and the society isn't deployed in this kind of way, and there are protections set up to protect my right to life, 
like we have laws on the books that say don't murder. Does that mean people are still going to get murdered? Yeah, that can still happen. But from the standpoint of what society is up to, right, that is a that is not in line with the social system. So the social system is not affirming that or creating space for that. And if people take it, then the system is set up to respond to that, right, as saying that's not okay. There isn't a legitimate space for you to use your liberty in this way, killing another person. And so there's going to be accountability for this. Um, same thing with property. Um, if someone, if we have property rights, we're all playing a game that allows for people to have control, legitimate control, by the lens of the society or the government. Um, someone is being given legitimate control over something. Um, like, I I have this property, my Mr. Spock coffee mug. Um, this is my property. Society says I'm allowed to have control over this object. Hmm. Yeah, loving that control. But can someone steal it? I mean, I don't know where you're at right now. If you busted over to Issaquah and grabbed the coffee cup, I, I could do this in class a lot more easily. <laughs> if you came out here and, and grabbed my coffee cup away from me, you might still be able to do that because of power. But it wouldn't be a legitimate action. And there could be consequences that would be themselves authorized by society to deal with your theft, right? So theft can still happen, um, but it, it's a difference between whether individual people are violating the rules of society versus whether society is, um, you know, making spaces or not making spaces with its rules and conventions. Now, you might also say, and this would be a very important thing to be tracking, that there's, just like Mill points out in On Liberty, there's a difference between the political system and the social system. And if you have a law in the books that says, yeah, stealing is wrong, but everyone in society is like, okay with stealing from college professors, then in a way, having that law in the books just doesn't mean anything. It's empty words. It's, a, it's an empty convention. Um, maybe if some of you have been tracking politics over the last year, or <laughs> few years, um, we have uh, checks and balances in the system, but the question is when the time is, uh, when we have a circumstance that they are designed or that they are appropriate for, do they actually get exercised? If they don't get exercised, then it's just a bunch of empty words. So it's going to depend on being enacted to a certain extent whether this is the true uh, pattern of what our game of social cooperation is like. This becomes, as you can imagine, analyzing this and pinning down like what are the actual conventions of a society is going to be incredibly difficult work um, and that's why sociology is a serious science and yet it is also at the same time a very or sometimes people pejoratively refer to it as a soft science but it's not soft because um, people that do sociology are not rigorous empiricists, it's because what we're trying to empirically understand is extremely complicated and hard to get a measure of. Uh, but there are good, you know, there's techniques for making better or worse arguments in sociology for sure and how to do this research and observation of what is happening in society. But, but this is the kind of theoretical setup for, I think, following what Nozick and some of these other uh, philosophers were about to study, what they're up to. Um, chat, let me know. How's this going so far? There's some big ideas there. If you want to just jump in with the microphone, by all means, go for it. Sometimes it's a little faster yeah. than typing. Following along, making sense, cool. Would Nozick be in support for the case of reparations? Um, that's something we definitely want to talk about. Um, that that that's got, getting ahead a little bit here, um, but just as a to something we can stick a pin into. Um, this would be about uh, Nozick has a number of principles uh, uh, for economic justice, and one of them is. Uh, you need to have rules in your social system or in your uh, ethical theory of, of just holdings. Um, you need a way to deal with how to rectify injustice in holdings. 
So that reparations would be an option for how to do that. I think if I remember right, Nozick, uh, I'm just getting into it now, um, but there's some other people typing in the chat, so maybe I'll talk while, while you're getting your text message in there. Um, so uh, I think Nozick historically uh, makes comments like um, reparations for slavery, for example, are not viable. Um, they're, uh, I think he complains about how hard it is to figure out from whom and to whom um, to, to make up for that. Like he talks about how rectifying injustice and holdings is much more straightforward. Like if in a case where you steal my Mr. Spock mug, okay, we, we know what to do. Give me back the Mr. Spock mug. And if you're like, sorry, I smashed it, then it's like, okay, what was the market value of this? And then you give me that money so I can get another Mr. Spock mug or something like that, right? But the, um, the injustices that happened around slavery, Nozick says, is like harder to pin down. Personally, I... I don't buy that. <laughs> I think we can do something about this. Uh, I think Coates lays out a really good case in that reading that I, I gave you optionally to take a look at the the case for reparations. Um, but I mean, what Nozick says about reparations certainly, um, just when he talks specifically about this one case, um, is maybe different than what his theory sets up. And you maybe notice a theme about this that philosophers don't always have the maybe the best measure of their own theory and their theory can be inspiring or insightful and yet their own comments they're they're not the last word on their own theory even that that happens we don't own ideas like that and at least in terms of the principles that Nozick sets up in his theory yes there is logical space for reparations um, and he is okay with that uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what would be the basis of justification for this in a second um, Really enjoying this topic. Wouldn't social norms sometimes turn into the law itself? Yes, but even if they don't, they still do the same work in sort of shaping the uh, system of cooperation that we're engaged in. D does that answer your question? I think that's Jeffrey, right? Yeah, okay. Um, how does Nozick separate inequality and injustice? We will talk about that, Mark. Um, that is a major, major theme for what Nozick is up to. Okay. Um, so, actually, I have my lecture notes up here, so I don't get off uh, track too too much here. Let me pull this up. Okay. There's a lot of ideas to get through here. Um, all right. So. Nozick does some framing here that is relatively uncontroversial. When we're going to talk about um, a moral theory, uh, a political theory of property, where we mean by political, again, a very expansive use of this that includes things like social conventions and not just the law or the government or the state. Um, but if we're talking in just how should we organize society uh, in light of something like the moral significance of property ownership. Um, Nozick says any theory is going to have to handle three things. And, and like I said, this is not very controversial. This is just like, what is the topic we're discussing and what does it require? One is that you've got to have some story about what he calls justice in acquisition. There need to be rules for how things that are previously unowned become owned in a just way. And that's what we'll actually come back to that at the very end of the Nozick reading, which will actually also connect back with Locke. Uh, Nozick uses a lot of Locke here uh, to talk about property. So we're gonna we're kind of getting in a little bit more of Locke's philosophy at the same time that we're doing Nozick here. Um, so that's a question of like, how do things go from being unowned to owned? That happens in a just way. You can absolutely imagine ways in which this is done unjustly. But it also seems like we need to have some kind of space for how that gets started. The second category is going to be justice in transfer. So how something goes from being owned by one person, so they already own it, they already have legitimate moral right to control of this thing, and how does that get transferred to somebody else? Theft is the classic example of injustice and transfer, right? Where someone takes ownership or control over something in a way that isn't morally appropriate. And you might say it doesn't become their property when they steal it. 
and it, to which we would say, well, yeah, maybe morally, maybe that you say that just in the sense of this is an unjust transfer, but in a de facto way, they have control of it now, and the other person who used to, who does have the property ownership of it, the person who is the victim of the theft, um, they no longer have that control, and that's the reality that we're concerned about with property rights. Okay, so we've got justice and acquisition, how unowned things become owned rightfully, justice and transfer, how things justly transfer from one person to another person's ownership, and then we've got rectification of injustice and holdings, which I was mentioning a second ago. So when there's a violation of either one of those two things, like someone got ownership of something that they shouldn't have taken ownership of, they don't have a right claim to it, um, that's one. And the other one is what do you, you could, so that's one case in which you could get into a state of injustice with regard to property ownership if someone isn't entitled to it in the first place. The second way could be if a unjust transfer occurred. Okay. Now, what are those? Uh, well, okay, sorry, getting ahead of myself. So whatever you say about what the parameters of justice are with regard to those first two categories, once you have scenarios that are not meeting those conditions, you're going to need some way of responding to that. How do we make justice happen in light of injustice? And you want to have rules for that. You, and this is the same for mor any moral theory. Um, if the moral theory is setting up this, this ideal of like how the world ought to be, what, what do you do? What does the moral theory tell you to do when it doesn't happen, which inevitably occurs? Right? People don't follow that ideal. They don't live it. They transgress those laws. What's the moral response to this? And that's the space of punishment. Many of you are working on punishment as part of your papers for the class, and we uh, this might sound really familiar from some of the phone calls we've had, where we've been talking about how um, punishment is just, uh, uh, we should have probably a loose definition of it, that it's just whatever you think is an appropriate response to wrongdoing. And a moral theory needs to have that component to it as well. And so Nozick is just acknowledging that, as a part of setting up his own theory here when it comes to property. So um, those three things, those three categories of what a, an economic, a, a theory of economic justice would look like uh, is pretty uncontroversial. Those are, this is one way to carve up the logical space of what your theory needs to be able to accomplish. This isn't a, a major like assumption or something on Nozick's part that's, that's super controversial. Now if you wanted to dispute we can definitely have a talk about that but I think if it, it really does capture a lot of the things that people can be worried about when it comes to um, justice with regard to property this is not his substantive theory this kind of framing the, the next question is going to inevitably be okay what are the actual rules that answer to those three theoretical objectives so what are the rules for how unowned things become owned justly how what are the rules for how a just transfer what does that look like and what are the ways or mechanisms of a just rectification of injustice that's that's the big thing okay checking in again with chat how's that going any questions about that Making sense? Cool. Thank you for the positive feedback. Always appreciate that. Looks like there's another message coming up, coming down the pipe. Going well? Okay, cool. Awesome. That is a really goofy emoji. That actually looks like the haircut that I have. <laughs> and I used to, um, in high school, my hair was like really long, and it used to always go like over half my face. There's some really embarrassing photos I've got from my younger years. <laughs> Niha's saying thumbs up, cool. There's still another comment coming in here. Okay, can you explain the third one one more time? Because in the reading, it said that no one is entitled to a holding except by the first and second rule. Okay, yeah, let me explain this. So, 
rectification of injustice in holdings is a way of uh, it's setting rules for responses for what should happen with regard to property when the first two rules are violated. So when the parameters for a just acquisition or a just transfer are not met, then you have injustice in holdings. Holdings just being what people have property over or control over, what they like literally are holding, but also metaphorically holding what they have control of. Um, so you have an injustice in regards to the state of holdings. And so the third principle is about how do we fix that or what's the proper response. So the same way that normally the government wouldn't be justified in just picking you up and carting you off to prison to, to be like confined in a cell somewhere, that would be unjust. And if the government starts doing that to its citizens, like say to political dissidents or something like that, we'd be like, boy, that's an unjust government. But if you just murdered 10 people, then the government is absolutely within its right to do something like that. Um, or at least most of us would say so. That yes, there should be, it is okay for uh, acts that otherwise would not be morally justified to become justified uh, as a response to the wrongdoing. Maybe in a way of trying to make it better. So normally, for example, think about the state just as an illustration, because this could happen in a more informal societal way, but let's just use a government because it's more straightforward. Let's say you steal my Mr. Spock mug. And I complain to the authorities about it, and it goes through the due process justice system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, you're convicted of this crime. Then it seems like the state can, through force or threat, a threat of force, take the Mr. Spock mug from your control and return it to my control. Okay? That would be a rectification of injustice in holdings. When you're saying no one is entitled to a holding except by the first and second rule, that saying that the, the third principle about the rectification is only for the sake of making sure that the first two are being followed or to try to correct or pick up the pieces after they're violated. Is that is that helping? Naomi? Yes. Cool. Awesome. And uh, Anthony, you got a message here too. That cleared up something I didn't even know I was confused on. <laughs> Perfect. What was the thing you were confused about, Anthony? Sometimes that's helpful. Maybe some other people are thinking the same thing you were. Oh, with the three rules. Okay. Okay. Um, we've got 11 minutes left here for class today. Um, I want to uh, try to start getting into what Nozick says in substance about this. Um, so the next big idea here is Nozick says when it comes to answering those questions about justice and acquisition, justice and transfer, just uh, rectification of injustice and holdings, um, when it comes to those three things, there are two sort of theoretical ways you can approach it. And he thinks that most uh, theories have taken one of these routes and he's going to be arguing for a different way, the, the second route. So the, the thing that he thinks is the most common way of approaching justice and holdings um, is what he calls an end result or time slice principles. Um, that a distribution of resources in a society is just depending on some, what he calls a pattern, right? So uh, he uses this quote, right, each according to their blank, and then different theories fill in that blank in a different way. So each according to their need, or each according to just being a person. So that would be like straight equality or something, like we should all own equal amounts of something. Or each according to, they, it could be merit, right? Merit, a meritocracy is not what um, uh, Nozick is going to be arguing for, even though you might expect that given his libertarian tendencies, he's not actually a meritocratic philosopher. Um, that would be part of this category of uh, theories of economic justice that he's rejecting. Um, but if, if each according to um, what they've earned or something like that, uh, that, that also would be something he'd reject. But that there's going to be some kind of um, pattern to the distribution of these benefits and property holdings 
uh, and we're just looking at those patterns to figure out whether justice is happening or not. So the, the probably the most salient example here would be income inequality. Just the massive, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm sure you've seen the charts and the statistics and stuff about how much of the wealth is held by how few people. So these massive inequalities of wealth would be, and if people look at that and they're like, how can this be right? They're probably using a perspective on economic justice that looks like one of these patterned um, product-based or end-result-based moral theories that, that Nozick actually disagrees with. Um, he thinks these aren't correct. So um, they would just analyze the situation, say, whoa, there's something goofy going on here uh, with the pattern of the distributions, so we're going to fix that. Okay? So before I get into N Nozick's famous argument against those patterned end result time slice principles approaches, um, I want to talk about what he is sort of offering in its stead. And I, and I think this might be the, the last bit of stuff we get to talk about today. Um, he's offering what he calls a historical view of justification for property ownership. So what, what is a just holding? He says you have to figure out how it came about. Not what holdings people have, but where they got them. So it, you have to look at the historical story behind how they have possession or control over it that they do right now. Instead of looking at what people own, think about how did they get it. <laughs> That's really the, the way to sum up Nozick in a nutshell. So um, if someone acquired something through fraud or theft um, or through violence um, or exploitation, then these are not legitimate um, acquisitions or legitimate transfers. This cannot be done. Um, we'll talk about justice and acquisition a little bit more later because there's some extra special wrinkles with that one, but just think about justice and transfer. So what would Nozick say about um, the property ownership? Let's say you buy some land right now. Well, this is going to be a little tricky, but there's absolutely the theoretical room to consider things like how did this property get owned in the first place or how did control uh, pass through people to the point that you were buying it from a realtor or something like that. And there, the historical story is that this happened through massive theft. Theft accompanied by violence, um, genocide, rape, um, exploitation, um, slavery. These, these are the, the historical stories behind the distribution of resources that we have today. And from a historical perspective, that wasn't that didn't come about in a just way and so it's an illegitimate holding and then there then the question would be well what do we do about it and then you need to have a theory of rectification of injustice and holdings but to first just identify what are the rules or principles by which we'd identify that there was a problem before we decide about how to how to respond to it um, Nozick is thinking about this in a historical way he's like that's that's how you figure out whether it was right or wrong um, what is the historical way that Nozick would consider legitimate? He thinks it's entirely a matter of just what people freely consent to do. Um, and that's the sort of libertarian angle to Nozick's philosophy. Here's a, here's a quote from him. He says, okay, I, my, my solution is no pattern. The historical theory, the historically based theory, doesn't have a pattern to it like the, all these other opponents that he has. Um, but instead, he, he would say, but if you wanted me to give a pattern, so I give you like a rule or something, he's like, how about this? From each according to what they choose to do, to each according to what they make for themselves, perhaps with the contracted aid of others, that contract needs to be consensual, because it's just someone deciding to do something, and what others choose to do for them and choose to give them of what they've been given previously, under the same maxim or and haven't yet expended or transferred so like I can't give you ownership of something I've already sold to somebody else for example um, he says it, you could summarize it as from each as they choose to each as they are chosen so this is why Nozick is not a meritocratic philosopher either um, 
If I give you a gift, it doesn't matter whether you deserve it or not. It was mine. I decide what I do with my property. I freely elected to give it to you, and you accepted it freely. End of story. Nozick's like, if that's happening, I have no cause for moral complaint. If, that, if that's how the transfer happened, great. Awesome. Checks out. Now, if I illegitimately came to possess something, and then I give it to you, well, I don't have a right to determine what happens with that anyway, so my gift to you is also illegitimate. That's why I'm thinking that, from a theoretical, just looking at the theory of it, Nozick's theory absolutely has the basis for condemning all the property ownership that happens with land in our region right now, except maybe that that is given control to um, native peoples. Because for everybody else, the chain of legitimacy of the property holdings uh, originated with something that is deeply unjust in terms of a property transfer or property acquisition. Now we can get into the details of that. There's like land didn't maybe, uh, well, okay. <laughs> I want to get into this actually a little bit. How much time have I got? Three minutes? Woo! If you got some questions, start putting them in the chat I'm um, to kind of uh, tie up the bow for today's class, but I want to get this idea out there. So, um, and I, I may have some of the history of this wrong, but um, the a lot of the colonialist settlers in America looked at what native peoples were doing here and didn't see formalized law. And so they're like, cool, I guess this land is all land I could take, right? I just need to kind of convince or coerce uh, the allowing of this to happen. So like treaties were signed um, with native peoples and native communities, but it, it's very questionable how much of this, like people were on the same page in terms of what these things meant, right? Um, and the systems of society between those were different, which is not to say that native peoples had a less sophisticated one. They just didn't have one that looked like the European model. Um, the a European model that has, was like heavy on the legalism, right? But this is the point I'm trying to make about it. There still is a social system, even without a legal system. It doesn't have to be written down on a series of laws in order for there to be a political structure going on. And that's what was happening with Native peoples, too. There's an understanding of how land is to be understood in terms of something that you have agency with. You could say, like property, right? But all property means is like setting up boundaries of who is entitled to do what with what. Right? And that existed in a very robust ways, uh, in very robust ways in native cultures and native societies. And then when colonialists come and they are playing their whole game with it, those are definitely mismatched. Okay, but they're still both systems of property ownership. And uh, I don't know of anybody who could defend that what the colonialists did. Uh, in terms of taking land and taking ownership of the land would meet the kinds of principles of justice and transfer or justice and acquisition that Nozick is laying down. Um, so if the whole story of the justice and holdings depends on that kind of historical roots of it, then uh, everything down the line is also sort of illegitimate. Now, it gets complicated for figuring out what to do about it now, when it's like so far in the past and the people involved are no longer present. Like, you steal my Mr. Spock mug, then we know who to go after you <laughs> right um but what if this mr spock mug was stolen by you and then like 20 generations later you know with your descendants they still have the mr spock mug somehow it survived 20 generations you know what do we do about it then that's that's tricky but there's cause for it and that's the main point here nozick would still identify it theoretically as problematic uh, Anthony, I hate to be devil's advocate, but Nozick doesn't give me the vibe of being for Native American reparations. And he isn't. But I'm saying the theory that he's appealing to, this type of theoretical approach, is um, sets up the, the basis, the principled basis for that. And that's, that's kind of the important point. And this is also a little demonstration of like, just because some philosopher gives a theory and they say it should go this way, doesn't mean you can't take it and run it some other way. I mean, with just the logic I've thrown down so far about a historical approach to analyzing justice and holdings, you could absolutely make this kind of case um, on the basis of a theory like this. What does Nozick think about a just holding acquired through history by unjust transfer? 
uh, a just holding acquired by unjust transfer. I don't know what that means. Um, what do you have in mind, Mark? Are you talking about someone has a just holding and then it's transferred to someone else unjustly, like stealing my Mr. Spock mug? We got some some typing going on if you're watching this on YouTube. I, I may have to cut this short because I got another class I got to start teaching here. Um, but maybe uh, you can hang on to these questions. We can pick them up first thing tomorrow. Yeah? Okay. All right. Let's do that. Um, the the quiz on Canvas for... Oh, yes, code. Thank you, Angela. Oh, boy. Um, um, Mr. Spock is the code. Mr. Spock's the code for this video. Um, so I'll be posting the quiz probably during my break, maybe in an hour, maybe in a couple hours. Um, but stay tuned for it. It'll be up there. Mr. Spock's the code. Thank you to everyone who showed up today live. Really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to I'm going to bounce now for my next class, and I'll see you again tomorrow.